it was great how many people signed up for the meeting. And it was sad how many people were not able to enter the meeting. I've gotten many requests and decided that I would take the time to do this dress rehearsal so that those of you who missed the meeting can actually see the presentation. Let us get started. Behind me, there's death. A disease, an epidemic has ravaged the countryside. People are dying in the street. The medicine at the time, ineffective. The reason for what's taking place is calamity. Blame it on the gods. But all truth be told, there was nothing they could do. Here we are, the 21st century, and we're experiencing something similar in the sense that initially there was nothing that we can do. We're gonna look at pandemics through the centuries and not really concentrate on how many people died, but more on how it affected and changed history. The one thing we don't see today is people lying, dying and dead in the streets because of an epidemic or this pandemic. Our system has evolved to the point that we've learned to hide the dying from the living. With that, let's get on with the presentation. I guess I should introduce myself. I'm Dr. Alan Pierce. Uh, I caught the bug, not the bug of a disease, but the bug of research while working on my dissertation at Rutgers University. I found I loved doing research and have been doing it ever since. And actually my dissertation won a National Research Award. And I've written six books, the publishers, West Publishing, Glenco Mugura Hill, and I've been writing a magazine column on new and emerging technology for at least the last 25 years. And with that, let's get started. I'm going to share the presentation and we'll take it from there. This painting kind of shows what the ancients thought of the calamities that befell upon them. It had to be coming from the gods. There's no one else you could blame that the angels of death were flying above them and striking down the bad people, striking down good people, just because they must have done something wrong. The biblical definition plague, various calamities sent down as divine punishment. There are terms that are often bantered about and often used interchangeably. We're talking about plague, epidemic, and pandemic. And let's see what they're all about. We already have that biblical definition. You know, the, the, the plagues befallen on Egypt and all those other kinds of things. Uh, we also use plague in a medical way, any contagious epidemic disease that is deadly. So we have plague and now we come to epidemic. And, and remember they are used often interchangeably. Broadly used any disease outbreak that involves an exceptionally large population over a wide geographic area but we use it colloquially. We describe the drug, drug epidemic. The constant use of social media is an epidemic. And we use the word epidemic to describe many other kinds of human behavior. So what's a pandemic? Basically, a pandemic is an epidemic with a passport, meaning it is not staying in one geographical area. It's climbed aboard planes, it's climbed aboard boats, it's climbed aboard trains, and it's moving and it's going worldwide. Now, George Santiana in 1863, Madrid, Spain, 
famous quote, those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. I want to point out something, and it's very, very important. This presentation is politically neutral. Basically, actually, one can find historical support for all the current arguments as to how we should handle this pandemic. Now, during this presentation, we're going to explore the following plagues. Prehistoric epidemics, the plague of Athens, 430 BC, the Antonian plague, 165 to 180 AD, the plague of Justinian, 541 to 542 AD, the Black Death, 1346 to 1353, the American plagues of the 16th century, the Russian flu pandemic, 1889 to 1890, the American polio epidemic, 1916, the Spanish flu, 1918 to 1920. That's the one they so frequently compare what we're going through today. And of course, we'll take a quick look at COVID-19, a certainly one that I'm sure that you're all kind of sick about hearing about and kind of wishing, when is it going to be over? Let's get started. Before we can really get into look at plagues, we really should take a look at what diseases can cause pandemics, the characteristics of pandemic pathogens. And uh, the material that we'll be looking at is actually from John Hopkins. Uh, I do want to point out that uh, what I'm doing throughout this presentation is supporting what I'm having to say. You're not listening to Dr. Alan Pierce just speaking straight from the top of his head. You're actually uh, looking, listening to, to Alan uh, quoting and paraphrasing from material from doctors and researchers and archaeologists and all the others that have looked at plagues through history. A global catastrophic biological risk. Okay, this GCBR. Now we're talking about the kind of disease that can really run rampant. And you'll notice at the bottom of the screen, there's actually uh, links almost everywhere and a couple might be missing, I apologize for that, as to where you can actually go to the particular pages and, and look at the research and look at what's actually there. For an illness to actually really become a global catastrophic biological risk, it has to have efficient human to human transmissibility. And as I point out these points, you might wanna think about COVID-19 and how it fits in with, uh, with these specific GCBR points. High fatality rate, absence of an effective medical countermeasure. A naive population, one that the disease can strike, not a population that somehow has faced this disease before and has now built up a natural immunity to it. It has to have some way of getting past the human immune system. It has to be able to, to, to do the invasion. If it can't do the invasion, it can't strike people down in the numbers that would, can make it be a deadly disease. A respiratory mode of spread is great for the disease because it's so easy to transmit it from person to person. If it has the ability to transmit during the incubation period before people are sick, think about it. People go out, they feel great, they move around, they talk to people, they go to the bars, they do all the things that not realizing and they would never want to expose their parents, their grandparents, their friends to a disease that could be deadly, but they don't even know they have it. 
Another great factor that makes a disease very, very effective is mild in illness in parts of the population because it augments the spread. Now, an important point is given the right context, any microbial organism could be thought of as a global catastrophic biologic, biological risk. However, in our century, the 21st century, the most likely manifestations will be from a virus. And that's because of our advanced medical system. But let's take a look at the different pandemic pathogens. Bacteria. Bacteria are living organisms. It's an important point to remember. Today, broad spectrum antibiotics, you know, really kind of limit the possibility of bacterium doing or affecting huge parts of a population. Now, the uh, actual broad spectrum antimicrobial started with sulfur drugs in 1935, uh, penicillin in 1942. And of course, since then, many, many other antibiotics have been developed, developed that are used today that prevent bacteria usually from doing the kind of damage um, that we can see with a virus today. Now, the most famous bacterium disease is the bubonic plague. Often, you know, it's called by the Black Death in 1346 in the picture that was before me at the start of the presentation. And what you see over there is what it looks like, but it's an infection of rodents caused by this Yersinia pestis bacterium. It's tr transmitted to humans by the bite of infected fleas. But once humans get it, they do a good job of spreading it all, uh, all on their own. And that's where it becomes kind of, became very, very deadly in the past. What about today? Do we have to worry about the Black Death? Well, first of all, if you take a good look, that's what it looks like. And you can see it looks very, very different. You know, it's a bacterium. Remember, what you're looking at there is a living organism. But as far as it, whether or not it has any effect today, from 2010 to 2015, there were 3,248 cases reported worldwide. This isn't, you know, now, 21st century. This isn't 19th century, 18th century, or going further back in the past. This is really very close to where we are today. And it's still happening today. Now, this is an ABC News report, July 14th, 2020. A squirrel in Colorado tested positive for the bubonic plague. And, but it's funny when you read that headline today, how it really catches your eyes because it brings home the fact that these deadly diseases are out there. Let's try to find a little humor during a pandemic. We have two rats walking, mama rat and baby rat. And baby rat says, look, ma, a human. <laughs> Don't touch it. They carry diseases. So, you know, wh who carries the disease and everything else is kind of in the eyes of the beholder. I mean, whether or not people think that this disease that we're now facing right now is all a hoax, again, in the eyes of the beholder. Now, the Human Microbiome Project defines normal bacterial makeup of the body. And this is kind of an important thing. And I, I believe most of the people in my audience kind of know this. And this is from the uh, NIH.gov. And I want to read this to you. The human body contains trillions of microorganisms, outnumbering human cells 10 to 1. So only one tenth of us is ourselves. The rest, trillions of microorganisms that live within us. Researchers now calculate that more than 10,000 microbial species occupy the human ecosystem. Most are friendly. Sometimes they cause sickness, but most of the time, 
These microorganisms live in harmony with their human hosts and actually provide vital functions essential for human survival. That's something to think about if you haven't thought about it before. Now, viruses, let's take a look at the next pandemic pathogen. They're not living. Remember the difference between the bacterium are living, viruses are not living. And they're only active within host cells, which they need to reproduce. Now, I think by now you probably heard me talking long enough and you probably would like the relief of seeing a, a little video. And what this video will actually do is it helps give you a better idea of what viruses and differences between viruses and bacteria are all about. Infectious diseases are caused by microbes. These are small organisms which are invisible with a naked eye and invade your body to get multiplied. The symptoms caused by an infection depend on the location, nature of the infection and type of the microbe. The two major types of microbes are the bacteria and the virus. Viruses are the smallest in size of all the microbes. They are able to attack almost any living organism. A virus uses another organism like a human being as a host. It means that the virus invades a cell of the body and uses parts of the cell to multiply itself. In this way, hundreds of new viruses are produced, which can spread throughout the body. They can also infect new organisms. Viruses can't survive outside the body of the host for long. Now notice this has changed a lot. And th this video is not a brand new video. It's a couple of years old. Notice it says screenomatic.com. Uh, I use this program to actually record right off of the internet. Why? Because the video that you're seeing here might be three minutes out of an hour video only picking up the specifics that I wanted to emphasize within uh, this presentation or other presentations I give. And I do give a lot of presentations really usually dealing with new and emerging technology or history of involving with technology. And, and we know today that COVID-19 can actually survive outside without a host for a approximately 16 hours. We're learning a lot more about that specific one. They can only survive a few seconds to minutes after leaving the host. Bacteria are much larger than viruses. They live almost everywhere and many of them don't cause infection. A bacterium multiplies itself by division. If the conditions are favorable, temperature, nutrition, some bacteria can multiply after every 20 minutes. Mostly, viral infection is simple and the complaints subside by themselves. It is difficult to eliminate viruses. Specific medicines have been developed only for certain viruses. Also, an infection usually resolves by itself. If this is not the case, the physician can prescribe antibiotics. This uh, picture over here shows you different viruses um, and the actual diseases that they, they cause. Uh, and, and one thing is we're involved with this coronavirus. Uh, there are many coronaviruses. It's, I think it's something important to actually mention. And you can see that they look kind of different. And if you look at the influenza virus, you can see how different it looks than some of the others. Now, what causes the flu? The flu is only caused, or it's, first of all, it's caused by a virus, but it's only caused by the influenza virus type A, B, and C. Now, as far as A and B, there are large uh, outbreaks seasonally. Flu vaccines could only protect against A and B. Now, there are other pathogens that can wreak havoc. And let's take a look at them. Pandemics, you know, as far as fungi for mammals is very low, but it still kills 1.5 million people annually. 
And this is, you know, as far as where it comes from, it, uh, it, it's listed down below in that little box. Outbreaks of fungi disease in amphibians, crops, bats, and bees, they actually represent a true threat to us because it could affect our food supply. And of course, it's people who are immunocompromised are the people who are greatest risk of something from fungi. But let's take a quick look at what fungi causes in humans. Okay, poisonous mushrooms are perfect and they're eaten by mistake. Allergies, mold allergies are very common. Parasitic yeast causes ringworm, athlete's foot. And you got some little pictures that show you what some of these things actually look like. Prions are a pathogen, but without a massive food contamination, it won't cause pandemics. But what is it all about? Prions is a type of protein that can cause uh, abnormal folding of cells in the brain. The risk factors for prion disease include family history, meat eating meat infected by mal mal mad cow disease, and infection from receiving contaminated corneas now let's take a look at some of the diseases caused by bacterium. And this is a partial listing. The bubonic and pneumonic, pl uh, pneumatic plague, typhoid fever, epidemic typhus, leprosy, cholera, meningitis, virus partial listening. Before I move on to that, I had one of the ones in the bacterium category, or actually a rather deadly one, had it as an infant and uh, from what I kind of pieced together, for, and it's part of the reason for the research into this particular and creation of this particular presentation, I'm assuming that penicillin had been actually created a, a short while before I had typhoid fever, and that was what actually saved me. But ever since I was a young child, whenever it came to going to a doctor's office, I was always, parents always said he's allergic to penicillin. So I'm assuming I got a very large dose and it saved me possibly, but also I had some sort of reaction to it, but I don't know. I had no recollection of actually even having disease, but found it in my baby records. Viruses, flu, SARS, yellow fever, hemorrhagic fever, Ebola, influenza, MERS, Zika, smallpox, measles, and of course our current COVID-19 pandemic. We're gonna start now taking a look at, well, now that we have some knowledge and some awareness of what the different uh, diseases that can wreak havoc, we're gonna take a look at what our ancient ancestors faced. And we're gonna start out with prehistoric epidemics. And we're talking about right now, life before the agricultural revolution. Back then, the people, the humanoids uh, were hunter gatherers. And they lived a nomadic existence with no permanent settlement. Uh, they gathered uh, what they needed to eat and they, they actually lived off the migratory animals and followed them and they foraged for food. Anthropologists indicate hunter-gatherer groups tended to range in size from an extended family to a larger band of no more than a hundred people. And important point with them is any disease that was easily transmitted between members of the group would quickly run out of people to kill. So the clan would die out and the disease would die out. Now it's interesting to, after I say that, and of course what goes through your mind, what did they die of? Uh, researchers, archaeologists have found uh, indications that early, uh, Euro early humanoids in Europe, Stone Age people, actually died of the plague. And uh, that has to do with examining DNA found in skeletons and skeletons that were found in caves and the carbon dating put them to the right, the skeletons to the right period of time. We're going to move, it's, we're continuing, uh, but we've moved up in time to 10,000 BCE. And so we're now in the first agricultural revolution. 
and you know people have spread over areas uh and what do we have? We have people using polished stone tools. They've domesticated animals. They planted crops. And they live now in permanent villages. Their crafts include pottery and weaver, weaving. Their crop storage was the perfect breeding ground for rats that carried the plague. And this is from December 2018. It's nature.com. A uh, plague linked to the mysterious decline of Europe's first farmers. And again, same thing as far as they found in the DNA um, that was still remaining in bones uh, that was carbon dated to the right time period, um, the, the Yersinia pestis bacterium. We're going to move to the plague of Athens, Greece, 430 BC. It is the earliest record pandemic and it happened during the Peloponnesian War. And the disease kind of moved around the known world at that particular time. Uh, what was going on, we had the Athen Athenians and Spartans at war. And uh, they, uh, many, many people died, not only from the battle, but actually from the diseases. Um, what What's good? It's very specific about taking a look as we look at the Peloponnesian War. The two most powerful city states in ancient Greece was Athens and Sparta. They went to war and the actual Peloponnesian War created a major shift in power in ancient Greece, favoring Sparta. And historians feel it ushered in a period of regional decline, ending the golden age of Greece. And this is from history.com. This is their words, not my words, uh, as far as what effect the disease had. And let's take a look at specifics about the Peloponnesian War. Athens had a large navy, maritime supremacy, and had control of commercial sea lanes. Sparta had a major land army. They trained in the ancient world. And, you know, we've all seen the movies with, which showed what the Spartans and how they, the, the military action and how they marched and how the things that they did, the fear that they brought about in people as they move uh, to do any kind of conquering. Now, what took place? The Athenian fleet was destroyed at a failed attempt to invade Sicily. Once that took place, the Athenians from the countryside, fearing the Spartans, crowded into Athens to avoid their advancing armies. Spartans were coming and moving in. They didn't realize that they had an enemy within because the disease was already in, amongst them. And the fact that they were crowding together was the perfect spreader. Now, what disease killed them is still debated. Possibly influenza, typhus, typhoid fever, bubonic plague, smallpox, and or the measles. The outcome, the outcome might have been different if the plague hadn't, hadn't ravaged Athens in 430 BC. The plague actually killed one third between, excuse me, between one third and two thirds of the Athenian population. We're gonna move on to the Antonian plague. That's 165 to 180. And this video does a good job of explaining what took place at that particular time. This is why the first plague, the plague of Antonine, was not really a plague like that of the bubonic plague. It wasn't fear of rodents, but fear of fellow man. The Antonine Plague began at the end of 165 AD. Galen, a Greek physician and author, witnessed the outbreak through its course and detailed its symptoms. Fever, diarrhea, vomiting, thirstiness, swollen throat, and coughing were among the ailments. Coughs had a foul smell and rashes formed over the entire body. The infected suffered these symptoms for an average of two weeks. Not everyone who contracted the illness died, and the survivors 
has developed immunity from further outbreaks. But based on Galen's description, researchers concluded that the disease affecting the Roman Empire did not stem from Yersinia pestis. It was most likely smallpox or measles. The key detail? Pustules or boils appearing on the skin. The epidemic emerged in China, spreading westward along the Silk Road by trading ships heading to Rome. The Roman military came into contact with the disease during its siege of Seleucia, a major city on the Tigris River. Troops returning from the wars in the east spread the disease northward. The extreme death toll was due to the disease's novelty to the people of the Mediterranean, known as the virgin population, who lack immunity for a specific disease. It is estimated that a quarter to a third of the entire population perished, somewhere between 60 to 70 million people, including Emperor Marcus Aurelius himself. The disease affected both the Roman military, whose weakened numbers could no longer hold borders, and economy due to a lack of businessmen and the inability of the government to collect taxes. The disease led to the rise of Christianity. The Antonine Plague was certainly the beginning of the end for the Roman Empire. Ernie Hanna, in the book The Route to Crisis, Cities, Trade, and Epidemics of the Roman Empire, argued that it was Roman culture, urbanism, and interdependence between cities and provinces that facilitated the spread of the disease, creating the blueprint for the collapse of the empire. Points from the video. He spoke very, very fast. The people often think the plague uh, was the Black Death, okay, uh, which is an infection of rodents transmitted to people. Antonian plague, often called the Plague of Galen, because it was documented by the physician Galen at the time of the plague, was probably smallpox or measles. It was brought to Rome by troops returning from campaigns unaware they would change history. We're going to move on to the Justinian plague, 541 to 542. And the source for the what I'm about to tell you is history.com as well as the Washington Post. The plague of Justinian was the first historically recorded Yersinia pestis bacterium plague, the Black Death. It killed as many as 100 million people. It appeared every 12 years till 770. It earned the name Black Death because the lymph nodes became swollen and blackened, and it gave that blackened appearance uh, to the skin you know, of the people who, who were afflicted. The plague changed the course of the empire, and it actually squelched Emperor Justinian's plan to bring the Roman Empire back together, and it caused massive economic struggle. It's also credited with creating the perfect atmosphere for the rise and rapid spread of Christianity. People are dying. You need an understanding of why they're dying. Uh, you need, your gods are not working. And here we have a, a, the promise of, you know, of a life and afterwards uh, that you would go on living, that you can come back and, you know, that it's, you know, all the things, uh, all the precepts of Christianity, which which talked of being reborn in, 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 in heaven and in hell. And if you were a good person, the disease might kill you, but you'd go to hell. That All that kind of stuff had a major effect and helped to spread Christianity. And um, when I've given this presentation, one of the first times I gave this presentation, it was perfect because there was a theologian in the audience who was able to talk of this in much greater respect than I can. The effects on history. The plague weakened the Byzantine Eastern Roman Empire at a critical point, okay? And um, the evolving conquest would have reunited the core of the Western Roman Empire and it didn't take place. We now look at the Black Death, 1346, 1353. Growing economies also made way for urbanization and a rising urban population. This resulted in crowded neighborhoods and the accumulation of waste, which created unsanitary living conditions. Cities and their residents essentially became incubators for germs and diseases. This was particularly evident in the second and most infamous plague pandemic. In the 14th century, Europe was experiencing an economic and population boom, especially in cities. Proper waste management did not exist at the time, making cities vulnerable to disease. After trade routes brought plague from Asia, where it killed millions in China and the Middle East, 
The disease wiped out about a third of Europe's population, earning itself the moniker, the Black Death. What also aided in the transmission of the disease was the lack of medical knowledge. <coughs> For most of human history, the cause of illnesses, germs, was unknown, making sicknesses like the plague a mystery. This lack of knowledge drove the spread of disease as recently as the 19th century. Outbreaks in Northwest India eventually reached major port cities in China. In just over a century, plague was exported throughout the globe and caused outbreaks in every continent except Antarctica. Now, we're going to look at some stuff from Time magazine. This is from Time magazine. The plague killed 30 to 50 percent of the region's population. The disease itself was horrific, but it's a big but. The Black Death was a selective killer. And after the Black Death ended, there was actually an improvement in the standard of living. The plague was natural selection in action. And that's from Sharon DeWitt a biological anthropologist from the University of South Carolina, a quote from her from that Time Magazine article. The article continued. Suddenly there was a dramatic drop in the number of able-bodied adults available to do work, which meant survivors could charge more for their labor. At the same time, fewer people meant a decreased demand for food, goods, and housing. And as a result, the prices of all three dropped. By the late 15th century, real wages were three times higher than they were at the beginning of the 14th century before the plague struck. And that's also from Sharon DeWitt. From history.com, the Black Death, which hit Europe in 1347, claimed an astonishing 200 million lives in just four years. Forward-thinking Venetian officials in the port city of Ragusa decided to keep newly arriving sailors in isolation until they can prove they weren't sick. A practice that we're trying to do today by stopping people from traveling into our areas uh, as a way of, uh, you know, having people um, stay home, having people stay out from areas, you know, having people wait until it's clear that they are not able to transmit a disease. So quarantining the sick is not a new idea. Now, scary, very, very scary. The Black Death resurfaced roughly every 20 years from 1348 to 1665, 40 outbreaks in 300 years. With each new plague epidemic, 20% of the men, women, and children living in the British capital died. And this is still from Sharon DeWitt, the quotes all were from her. We're gonna move, you know, we're gonna uh, continue looking at the Black Death, but uh, kind of the specifics about the idea of staying away from sick people. It's not a new idea. Okay, um, trying to keep people out from our area who are sick is not a new idea. And the fact that trying to take sick people and, and keep them separated from healthy people is not a new idea. The picture you're looking at over here is from the Tokenberg Bible of 1411, showing it as far as the Black Death. It shows a couple, couple suffering from the bubonic plague, and by 1411, people knew that quarantining the sick could protect the healthy. I'm going to move on now to the plagues of the Americas, and which was a gift of the European explorers, actually a gift that they didn't even know that they were delivering. And let's take a look at this video. 
down into four categories. Diseases. Boy, you're looking good, smallpox. I'm glad you've been eliminated. Animals, plants, and people. Mr. Green, Mr. Green, people are animals. Yeah, that's true, me from the past, but just for the sake of simplicity, we're also, if you think about it, microbes are kind of animals, and plants are too. I mean, oh my god, shut up before I kill you and create a time travel paradox. Microbes, like those hairy blokes back there, were a definite negative in terms of the Colombian exchange. Terminology is hard here, but the majority of Caribbean islanders or Native Americans or Amerindians had exactly one response to the arrival of Europeans death. We can't be sure how many natives died as a result of European arrival, but it was definitely more than 50%, and some estimates place it as high as 90%. Historians used to blame European brutality, which was definitely a factor, but the main culprit was disease. Smallpox is usually seen as the villain of this story, but it's more likely that a series of diseases in combination did the damage. Along with smallpox, Americans were killed by measles and mumps, typhus, chickenpox, none of which they had been previously exposed to. This astonishing decrease of population was definitely the worst effect of the these diseases both psychologically and demographically but the secondary effects were almost as bad for one thing the deaths of Aztec and Incan rulers touched off wars which in turn made it easier to spread disease because you know the number one way to catch smallpox is via hand-to-hand -hand combat plus leaders kept dying Huayna Capac the leader of the Inca Empire succumbed to smallpox before Pizarro even arrived his death led to a violent succession struggle between his sons which was won by Atahualpa who in turn was captured and killed by Pizarro and without so he talked very, 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 very fast. So let's take a look at some of the points. Uh, the American plagues were brought by European explorers. You have to realize that they, uh, as, as a group, um, had already, uh, you know, the disease, uh, they were not a virgin population, the explorers, but the people uh, where they landed were, they had never been exposed to the disease before. So a disease that would not affect the explorers could ravage the people in the areas that they landed. Uh, and it led to the collapse of Incas and the Aztec civilizations. 50 to 90 percent of the populations were killed off. The Aztec and Incan soldiers might have been able to fight the Spaniards even if they weren't being if they weren't being killed by the disease. So there was an enemy in their ranks once uh, it was caught and starting to be transmitted by the native populations. And, and this, you know, this in as well as the superior weapons, but as far as weapons, the numbers of the native populations compared to the numbers of the actual explorers was such that it wouldn't have been a, an even battle, even with the best weapons that they had at that time. They had no nuclear weapons in uh, an automatic and uh, okay, I'll leave it at that. Uh, with the explorers from Spain and Britain came was uh, they conquered the native populations who were already now being hit hard by the diseases that were already brought by the first explorers. We're going to look at the Russian flu pandemic of 1889 to 1890, and this was from Wired.com. It shows a picture of uh, of, of so it's a woodcut, actually, but let's take a look at it. First disease to quickly travel the world. That's what's most significant about it. Trains and ships allowed people to travel throughout the world. In just a few months, the Russian flu was all around the world. It killed more than one million people. The disease, disease started in Russia and spread to Europe by roads, rivers, and trains. It then boarded ships to spread around the globe. And you can notice it where it would be, it comes from NIH.gov and LiveScience.com is the two places where, um, where the information that I'm giving you is backed up from, you know, as far as what I'm saying, you know, as far as uh, someone to paraphrase. Some points. Uh, they actually could actually trace the path and, and the people realized it because where the train stops were was where the outbreaks would take place and, and, and the other kind of crossing areas. It gave This gave credence to the theory that disease was spread by human contact, not by the wind or other me means. And the Russian influenza is often cited as the first modern flu pandemic. The American 
polio epidemic of 1960. And this is from uh, a presentation at Columbia University. It's a very small piece from it. And that's a professor to his virology class. polio vaccines is because of Franklin Roosevelt, who had polio as a young man and was paralyzed. He couldn't walk. He founded the March of Dimes, the fundraising effort for the National Foundation of Infantile Paralysis to raise money, and that money was used to develop the polio vaccines that we use today. In the 30s and 40s in the U.S., hospitals were full of iron lungs because people would lose their respiratory function. They were put in here so that they could breathe until they they regained it. You don't see any of these now, of course. Uh, polio, of course, is an RNA-containing icosahedral virus, relatively small, with a plus-stranded RNA genome. The first vaccine to be developed was an inactivated polio vaccine. It's called IPV. This was developed uh, by Jonas Salk. He did a huge clinical trial in 1954, 1.8 million children, the biggest ever done as far as we know, and it gave reasonable protection, not great, 50%. It was licensed in April of 1955. And these are the headlines in New York City newspapers. You can see that polio was a big deal. Let's take a look, and, and there's a picture showing what these eye and lungs actually look like. Polio reached epidemic proportions in the early 1900s in countries with relatively high standards of living. Why would high standards of living have a, an effect on increasing the amount of a disease? And this is from the history of vaccines.org as far as where this material is coming from in that quote. The theory is that in the past, infants were exposed to polio mainly through contaminated water supplies at a very young age. High standard of living, less contaminated water. Infants' immune systems aided by maternal antibodies that were still circulating in their blood quickly defeated polio virus. And at the same time, the children developed a lasting immunity to it. But better sanitary conditions meant that exposure to polio was delayed until later in life when a child had lost maternal protection and was also more vulnerable to the most severe forms of the disease. The Salk vaccine, which was released as the doctor, as the professor said, 1955, uh, it was 39 years, it took 39 years to develop that particular vaccine. We're up to the Spanish flu of 1918, 1920. And this video from the New Yorker will help to kind of explain what this one was all about. When influenza came along, national public health leaders said, this is ordinary influenza by another name. It was referred to as Spanish flu. That was echoed in nearly every place in the country. The Surgeon General said, if proper precautions are taken, you have no cause for alarm. In other words, they did nothing and they lied to the public. Your book describes uh, a, a tragedy of unbelievable scale in the United States alone 675,000 people died, which is comparable to about a million point seven. This is in 1918. What are we facing now? How does this resonate with you? This, this, your history of 1918 must play in your head all the time as you're watching television, as you're thinking about what's going on. Uh, a little bit too much, uh, right? <laughs> well, you know, they're, they're both respiratory viruses, obviously. Fortunately, this virus is I think considerably less lethal than 1918. Unfortunately, this virus is much more contagious than 1918. So even with the lower fatality rate, uh, which we're still not sure exactly what it is, uh, but it does clearly seem to be lower than 1918. Uh, even with that lower fatality rate, because more people are going to be infected, we're still facing, you know, 
incredibly dramatic, unfortunate numbers. One of the most chilling moments in your book about 1918 comes when you compare Philadelphia to St. Louis. What happened there? Philadelphia was one of the first hit it, cities hit. They, again, echoed the line that the national government was uh, putting out there. They had a huge Liberty Loan parade scheduled. Virtually everyone in the public health community and the medical community wanted that canceled, except the public health commissioner. He was part of the political machine, had no backbone. So the uh, parade went forward, and just like clockwork, uh, roughly 48 hours later, the disease exploded in Philadelphia. It ended up with about 14,500 deaths, if my memory serves. About two-thirds of them died in a 14, 15 week period beginning in late September, 1918. St. Louis imposed all sorts of social distancing measures early and, and had a much better outcome. They did in fact flatten the curve. A question, there seems to be a minority opinion, but it's one that I've, I've heard come up and it, and it certainly influenced at least for a while Boris Johnson's thinking in, in the UK. Oh, the herd immunity thing? Yes, the idea is you let the uh, influenza sweep through the community, the death rate is higher, but you haven't destroyed your economy. Because if you destroy your economy, the downstream effects of that are even worse on the public health, that, that a prolonged depression would lead to all kinds of horrible public health consequences, even worse than the flu. What, what do you think of that rationale? Well, I think it's a legitimate question to ask. The question is, what price are you going to have to pay to get there? Right now, I think it looks like the number of deaths that might occur would be high enough that that would argue against uh, that approach. I actually do agree with Trump on one thing, and that is once we get past this, I think the economy will surge. There are still going to be, unfortunately, a tremendous number of dislocated workers. You know, hopefully Congress, as we are taping this, you know, Congress is trying to figure out what they were going to do. Uh, hopefully that will be addressed. Something like, uh, I heard, you know, Schumer say the, the government should guarantee four to six months of uh, full compensation. Okay, basically uh, some important points. Um, the Spanish flu was given the name Spanish flu, uh, but it didn't start in Spain. Uh, World War One was was on, and um, the, the press uh, uh, from of the different countries um, were keeping uh, information about the flu uh, secret. Uh, Spain uh, was not involved in the war, and its free press actually wrote about and spread the word about what this flu was all about. And then the flu got named the Spanish flu, and much the same way uh, that what we've been afflicted with has been called the China flu by by certain people, um, but it seems pretty clear that it actually moved to Europe and came to us through Europe. And at the same time, it actually uh, had done some evolving as far as within it. There seems to be strains uh, on COVID-19 uh, COVID and as far as um, what we were actually uh, afflicted with. But let's move on here. You can see temporary uh, medical facilities. And if you look closely, you can see the people are wearing masks. In 1918, since the group of people that were most affected by the flu were soldiers, it affected really the, the, the you know, the, the 18 to, to 30 year olds most. Um, it was considered patriotic to actually wear a mask something that did not happen so far here today. And that's part of the reason I think in my personal, why we're still suffering at the level we're suffering, while a country like China has managed to get things pretty squelched and Korea the same thing and almost return to normal. Now, um, Spanish flu killed 675,000 Americans. If you look at the numbers that uh, have died uh, today, uh, they're climbing rather dramatically. Uh, and um, we will, from expected by January, we will reach that kind of number. 
Uh, now, one of the effects was it killed important delegates. This is the Spanish flu who were supposed to go to Paris and help formulate the Treaty of Versailles. Now, many of these delegates from the US opposed World War I reparations and those reparations became part of the Treaty of Versailles. Those reparations were very, very punishing as far as to Germany and also a major humil humiliation uh, was uh, to the people of Germany and everything about Germany. And it's believed to have been a key rise, key reason for the rise of Hitler. Now, one of the other effects, so it, it considered that the Spanish flu actually brought rise in, in, and brought about possibly World War II and all the deaths that occurred during World War II. It also revolutionized healthcare and provided funding for epidemiology, the study of emergence and control of disease, and virology, the study of biological biology of viruses and how to control them. Um, we're really going to start taking a look at COVID-19 very, very quickly. And one thing is the biggest question is, of course, when can we get back to normal? And it seems that that, that seems to constantly evolving and getting further and further away. This photo is actually, you know, it, it is of, of the past. And you can see the barbers are wearing masks and, and the idea of trying to uh, prevent the spread of the disease. Um, there are two approaches to uh, handling COVID-19. One is the military approach. And it, uh, in the last video we saw, it kind of talked about um, the two approaches. And that's called, let's get back to work now. The a military concept that there gotta be acceptable losses. One must accept casualties when fighting a war. And just because the enemy that we're fighting is microscopic in size, doesn't change the fact that we have to win the war against COVID and we have to accept losses. Now using social distancing masks and waiting for a vaccine is taking the, your eye off the mission of fully opening the economy and her, herd is spelt wrong over there. I apologize for that. Uh, I heard of herd when I, I looked at this right now and that needed to be corrected and I didn't. Um, so going for herd immunity seems like a, a, a possibility, uh, but the amount of people that would die going for that, according to uh, our expert in that video would be way, way too high. But this military approach, pure military approach, more the Roman approach, how their soldiers would march. In the end, the healthy will survive and prosper. The poor, the elderly and endangered populations will suffer the heavy losses. Then to win a war, you need to accept that those who died did so for greater good. In other words, after this is all over, we'll build a big monument to all those who died as we sacrificed them to getting this disease under control. Millions can die following this particular policy if herd immunity cannot be achieved. And scientists tell us it won't. Now, what's the other approach? Open the economy going for, through a medically limited casualties approach. There's a battle plan. What's the battle plan? Test the population for the virus, make that a priority, track and quarantine the infected, use social distancing and masks to prevent the spread of the disease, protect the elderly and other endangered populations, keep them away from the battlefield, give scientists and doctors the tools and time to develop a vaccine that will stop the pandemic and then carefully and responsibly reopen the economy. If we took this approach and really stuck to it in a very, very solid way, kind of what New York has done, uh, and certainly what China has done, what Korea has done, um, we would probably have this under control. 
But the, because we've been vacillating and, and not really uh, having a, a national plan, this has not really taken place. And this is actually an article that is one that is supporting the military approach. And this is one that is supporting the social isolate, uh, distancing isolation approach. Uh, now, what about the vaccine? There are anti-vaxxers and they're already mobilizing. And the latest word is that less than 50% of the population are willing to take a vaccine if it comes out. And that is a, becomes a great problem as far as fighting uh, the, the actual illness. For many, it's because they feel that it's being rushed and they don't, they don't feel that it will necessarily be safe. They want to you know, wait more time and so forth. And so basically, if the scientists, if people see that the scientists have the, have the lead and the researchers have the lead and testing is following normal testing procedures so that the results are verifiable, People, more people would be willing to actually get the vaccine uh, than otherwise. Now, could a vaccine be made compulsory? Jacobson versus Massachusetts was a Supreme Court decision which did make vaccination uh, indicating, you know, the, the basically the, the rights of, you know, your rights ended when if you could infect other people, that kind of kind of story. And um, and it, it's really on track right now to kill more people than the 1918 flu. Uh, and uh, you know, this was from uh, October 2020. These have already become kind of old since um, from when I gave the presentation, uh, you know, time has passed and the death rate keeps increasing. Now, what are some of the possible outcomes bringing uh, manufacturing back to America? Why we can't afford to have our supply chain interrupted in cases of future pandemics. That's one of the things that really created havoc. And the other is secure security needed for our advanced microchips. If we trust China less because uh, we feel that the, 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 the disease started there, um, we, we, we wouldn't want to, you know, we wouldn't want to be having our hands so much uh, where all our manufacturing is taking place. Now, who might become the winner? India could emerge over time from the pandemic as the economic winner. Uh, the idea of U.S. and other countries become more protectionist and less inclined to trust China. So we would actually move to another low wage nation, very possibly. Um, it's different presentation that I give and which goes for, you know, how things are manufactured, all about manufacturing and what determines where you manufacture a product and even how a product is manufactured. But it's not really a subject we're going to handle here. Now, conjecture versus hindsight. With this virus, understanding the past might help us not repeat it. But the historical effect of this plague can only be written in the future. How long we're going to be facing this, whether or not uh, there, the COVID-19 virus uh, is actually changing, its uh, DNA is changing um, uh, such that it, people can become reinfected. Will it pop up every year, which is considered right now a definite possibility? Um, if you get a shot for it, will you have to get a booster shot each year? These are all conjecture at this point and time will tell, and hopefully we will get a handle on this, we will get control of this virus. And also, it's not the last pandemic virus that we will be, that the world will face in the future. So hopefully we'll have the, 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 all the equipment necessary at, already and warehoused. So when we get hit again, we will be prepared to actually fight it in, in a much more um, effective way. I want to thank you for your attention. Uh, my email addresses are there. I do give presentations. Um, uh, and uh, when I worked for New York State, um, at the State Education Department, it was basically four days a week, I was traveling the state giving presentations. As a university professor, I gave so many more. I enjoy present presenting. If you have a group, that uh, you would like me to present, give a presentation, by all means, contact me. You have my contact information. 
I want to thank you again for your attention. And I want to wish you all a good day. And I'm going to end this meeting for everyone.